All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Feinberg. I'm with The Hollywood Reporter. And like you, I'm very excited to be here because it's not often that we get a chance to be in the presence of greatness. <laughs> Tonight we are. And so uh, I will just cut to the chase. Please join me in welcoming the one, the only, Al Pacino. Brothers and sisters. <laughs> well, thank you for doing this. It's a oh, uh, my pleasure. Treat. It's I, I, apparently this is what goes on now. There's a I mean, that's, no people come and do this. Sort of thing. <laughs> they do they, now after the movie opens too. I heard they, well, they yeah. go afterward and uh, talk to the audience. Yeah, but not everybody packs the house like this. Oh, that's, oh, uh, okay. wow. that's you. Thanks but. for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess I just want to begin with the fact that people may not know that this was this was something that Philip Roth novel comes out in 2009. And you went after this. This was something that you were passionate about. And I just wonder, you know, if you remember how you heard about it and what it was that made you want to go and do oh, that. Oh, yeah. I, I got a call from my agent, John Burnham. And uh, he's a pretty clever guy, actually. And he's, uh, he said to me, I think there's a book you'd like. It's about something. And uh, why don't you read it? I said, John, I'll read the book. He said, no, I think it could be a movie. I thought, well, gee. So I started reading the book, and I, I was reading, and I thought, you know, uh, a book uh, turned into a movie is not an easy thing to do, of course. But I thought, it, at least this is about something I know. It's a, an actor who's slipping down and out, you know. <laughs> so uh, I could relate. And I thought, OK. And it's a world, a kind of a world I know. And you know, it, it might be a, you know, a little bit of a lift up to try and make a movie out of it because they're so hard to put together. And of course, years later, finally, we got it, we got it together. And I went to Barry Levinson, who I had worked with before, and I thought this would be his, um, it, it would be territory he would like to go into. And because he also has, a, saw it in a similar way as I did, he, I, I found the humor in there, the subtext in the book. Uh, I, I, could, I found it funny. I, the only way I could put it, I, I thought it was funny. And I don't think Philip Roth meant it to be funny. Quite. <laughs> no. It's just the way it is. And uh, when you make it into a movie, you try to find at least what your connections are. So I, uh, I got Barry, Barry got Buck Henry, which you know, was pretty, he you know, thinks funny, I mean, he's funny. Yeah. And of course I found it interesting and humorous that an actor, having done this all his life, wants to, wants to turn into what he believes is a human being, <laughs> which is the real world full of humans. And he's not, or something. So I found that tickling. It tickled me that an actor would want to be a real person. No. So, <laughs> so we went on from there, and I got the, uh, Barry to write the screenplay. And I mean, Buck and Barry wrote it, and that took a while. So, well, one yeah. thing that I think may come as a surprise to some people is that even an Al Pacino project, it's, the money is not automatically there. It's unbelievable that uh, even just, to, it sounds like $2 million, I believe was the budget on this one, and that was a struggle to put together. And can you talk about just, um, you know, I guess that's just the nature of indie filmmaking today, huh? Yeah, well, I guess uh, when you think of it, there's, there's these variables to it. For instance, if you do a small movie, as you all know, we've all been in them, we, we know what they are, but sometimes the money people, so to speak, who are putting up millions of dollars, understandable, will want certain actors in certain roles because they sell territories that way. This is not a news story, this is a story we all are familiar with. Except sometimes, and I don't want to mention the movies, when you've seen, you know, a camel has entered the picture somehow. <laughs> They've cast camels in the parts. <laughs> because these are great actors, but not right for the parts. And they don't so, sort of, you know, gel together. And, and so it, it's very clear that everybody's in different worlds, especially <laughs> when they have different accents. <laughs> and they're living <laughs> different motive. Uh, you know, it, it just, uh, I've seen it happen. And so 
we had like six million dollars to make this picture. Uh, Twelve million it started. And, and then Barry thought, well, and then we were struggling trying to cast these people who the money people wanted. So you want to go cast actors that um, would bring them back their money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I keep saying, well, where's the risk? You, you know, there's got to be a certain amount of risk you take, you know. So we just brought the budget down and we kept bringing it down until finally it got around two and everybody got happy all of a sudden. And we used actors, you know, that we thought came out of this world, understood the environment, and uh, would, would do it in, in that fashion. And, and Barry wanted to shoot the movie, like on the run, so to speak. Well, can I ask you about that? Because one of the things that people may get a kick out of knowing is that a lot of this was in his own home. You don't have that yeah. on uh, too many studio yeah. movies they're going to shoot. True. It. So uh, I recommend it. Yes. <laughs> He's got a great place. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful kitchen, bathrooms are everywhere. <laughs> it's good. But the idea is that we would do it in three or four days and go, I would go away because I was busy doing something, he was, and then we'd return a couple of weeks later and I'd do four or five more days and then it, we did it in 20 days, this picture. Yeah. And everybody was cooperative and we were, I did a whole other movie while I was doing really? it. Really? Yeah. Believe it or not, I did. Well, is the, is the sort of downside of you know, it's, with indie filming, you can tell sort of more nuanced stories than the studios will allow these days, and obviously yeah. things like that. But I know that for you, maybe it comes out of your your theater background or whatever. But re rehearsal is very important to you, and that kind of yeah. tends to go by the wayside on a lot of the indies. That, right? That's true because now you have movies also, like they go six weeks is top. You know, you're really in. The, and I remember doing uh, movies with Lemet in the early days, who came out of television, but Lemet. Uh, did it in sometimes five, five, five weeks, six weeks tops, and you wondered how did he do that? And he moved the camera. It was, it was a joy to watch him, but we rehearsed a month, so it, you know, and he so knew what he was doing, and we were in rehearsal for a month, which I got used to being, from the theater and everything. I was, I was connected to that way of working. So I recently was on a picture, and I'm not going to name the picture either. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you know why I'm sorry? Because it's informative if you know some of the players here. But I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I save it for the book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll change the names. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there it is. I'm doing the scene. And we're, you know, and, 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 and uh, we're doing it. And this actor, very old, experienced actor, a great actor, actually. And I'm doing it with, with him, and we get there, and we're in this situation where there are a lot of other people in small roles, extras, and we start, and, and we're sitting there, and I say, hi, hi, I knew him from before. And all of a sudden, the director says, okay, let's roll. I said, he looked at me, I looked at him. I said, hey, excuse me? <laughs> I said, we, we haven't read it yet. <laughs> so we started reading the scene. He said, oh, okay, the director said, sure, read it. So read it, and the other actor I'm playing was a bit older, had a bit of, you know, but not, he could have been 20, it wouldn't have mattered, because he had this much to say with no rehearsal, and he's talking to me. And I'm looking at him, and he's talking to me. And we're talking to him, he's got the load, right? Yes. But I'm still wondering, what is he saying? <laughs> So the scene is over, and he says, okay. So I said, uh, excuse me, uh, I won't mention his name. So I, you, you think maybe we could have another try at it because this is the first time we're getting it. He says, oh, okay, you want to read it again then? <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, we just read it again quickly, you know what I mean. So we read it again. That's a little worse, right? <laughs> so I said, oh, yeah, what am I going to come up with now? So he gets it, and I said, oh, look. Uh, he said, well, you, okay, let's get, I said, no, if you could just hold on just for a second. You know these extras in there, you think we can try the scene I'm being, with them actually speaking, so we get a feeling of what it's like for them to talk. I'm bullshitting now. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, he says, yeah, 
He says, yeah, you want to hear them talking so you can, absolutely, yes. I said, that's what I want. He says, oh, okay, let's go uh, do it that way. So meanwhile, my friend is getting more into it and he's learning it a little bit more. He knows a couple of lines now. And so <laughs> he said, we finish once again and it's, okay, cut. And everybody's like, producers are in the wings. They're all like shaking in people's eyes. <laughs> and I said, oh, wow. I said, I looked at my friend and I saw him. He was still like, you know, a little wet around the lips there. <laughs> so I thought, okay. I said, listen, uh, I have it really now. I got it now. So I, I said, let's do one when they're not speaking. The extra. <laughs> <laughs> but then I really get a sense, because sometimes you feel like you're in a vacuum when everybody stops talking. The director's looking at me now. He's starting to worry. So I said, just, just one more time with it so we get it. I said, wouldn't that be OK for you? And again, my friend says, yes, yeah, yes, it'd be fine. So we tried again without anybody speaking. Somehow we got four run-throughs. <laughs> he guess he's so worked up, the director. So he finally comes, OK, he's ready. He goes, action! And he hadn't, he hadn't start rolling the camera yet. He was so ready to go that he said, action. He would have said action to a, you know, uh, a donut. I mean, it was just <laughs> and we did the what? scene. And that's movie making. We should call all movies out there nowadays. Yeah. Not all of them, but most of them. Should all be called rushing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, w I want to come back to that because I think that it, within your, within, you know, your, the span of the time that you've been making movies, that, that's, that wasn't always obviously. Oh the no, case. it was too long before the yeah, old days. Yeah. Like years of young movies. <laughs> this is not Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned into it all. But I'm, I'm, I guess I, I wonder if you can talk about what it was like for for you with with your background, your training, your method of acting hmm. to share uh, scenes with somebody. In this case, Greta Gerwig, who is oh. a product of this mumblecore movement, which is it's sort of, I guess, guerrilla filmmaking. It was yes. all of this. And, and what, what was, how did your two uh, sort of styles compare and contrast and mesh and all of that? I was fine with her because yeah. I make little films myself. Yeah. Nobody sees them, of course. <laughs> but I make them on my own. I made them in the old days. I, when I had it, I used to make them with my own money. Wow. And that was kind of strange. And I, I was accused of being crazy <laughs> for doing that. And I'm, I was. But it was uh, important for me to learn film that way. So I'm used to, uh, I like it. I like to mix it up. I did these Salome's. I did Looking for Richard. It took me four years. Wow. Uh, thanks. And I did uh, this new thing I've been working on for six, seven years with Jessica Chastain yeah. called Salome. And I put them both together. And I've been working on it. But we worked that way. So I'm used to it. And she. Uh, she was right. She fell right into it. She's great. And she's a great kind of girl, I, I must say. She's very quiet. And the odd thing is she doesn't talk much, which I sort of like, because you don't have to do small talk on a movie set because there's nothing as debilitating <laughs> as a lot of small talk <laughs> after a while, you know. Thank God for the camper. You know, it's finally, I, I see the reason we have one. <laughs> It was going under the table, of course, which is, but, but, but she was great to be, she, she worked just like, it, you know, and Barry loves that stuff, because Barry loves to change the scene when you come into it. He loves it when he's doing it, and then just says to you, uh, well, I don't know, you know, maybe we just go, and, why don't you say it in your own words here or there? And he'll change it all around, he'll flip it around, and it's wonderful. And she was right there with it. She just went. And uh, I, I, love, I love that about her. And she didn't do small talk. We were out once. We were out in a car, an open car, a sports car, like about a half a mile from where the camera was. We were about to do a take. And so I remember being in the car with her with this convertible. And we were sitting there. It was cold. And I was sitting in the passenger seat. She was in the driver's seat. And she said nothing and just kept, just sat there. And I sat there. And <laughs> then, one point, finally, <laughs> 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 
she pulls out a book. <laughs> and she starts to read it. <laughs> and I fell in love with her. <laughs> I mean, it was paradise. <laughs> and then they called, you know, action, and we went. Now for, for <laughs> I really liked her. <laughs> <laughs> and you do have a, a real eye for, for young talent. I mean, you are largely the reason that we have Jessica Chastain, for instance. Oh, wow. Right? Mm. Well, that was something. I was in, uh, I was casting for Salome. Well, very good actresses were coming in. And I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't, I didn't know, what am I going to, how am I going to do it? This, finally, this girl comes in. And she says, hi. I, and I knew that somebody had recommended her. That's why she, she was there. I had heard that she was interesting. And she got with this other person, and she started to just read from the script in front of me and this great guy, Robert, uh, Robert Fox, great English producer, a very big um, theater producer, tremendous experience and everything. And I'm sitting there, and she starts the reading. And I, I was... <laughs> I, I couldn't believe I was seeing this. I, so I turned to Robert Fox, who was sitting next to me, and said, are we dreaming? <laughs> and he said, no, we're not dreaming. Yeah. And I looked at her and thought, this is an acting prodigy. It was astounding. It was like she was like Marlon Brando or something. I, mean, I, I didn't understand it. Well, it, uh, and you know, if you ever see her one day when this movie goes somewhere, God knows where, <laughs> it's, just, it's worth it for her because it's a great performance she gives as Salome. And, 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 my, 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 uh, and that's when I went and did the movies. Yeah. Yeah. Six years later, she's this, uh, you know, this great uh, star. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And so many, so it's such prolific output as well. Oh, wow. But, uh, she, she, she's, uh, she's done Miss Julie, I heard. Yeah, she, this year, Miss Julie, Eleanor Rigby, uh, Interstellar, and a most violent year in one year. But she, she gives all the credit to you because, uh, yeah, man, you gave her the start. But I want to I wanna go back to <laughs> that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to where, where you sort of, sort of started talking about elements of this that you could relate to uh, in, in the humbling. Um, uh, have, have you ever felt sort of the, uh, your appetite for acting wane a little bit? Have you ever gotten so immersed in something that you sort of have had a, a blur between, uh, you know, reality and, and, what, and fantasy? Has it ever gotten that far down the line for you in either case, either of those things? Uh, well, in some ways things happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they always do. But I, I think that I basically just thought, well, uh, with an athlete, for instance, you, you, you are able, you can discern it a little easier. You start to, your reflexes start to go. Things, you know, like they say, first your legs go, <laughs> then your money goes, <laughs> then your friends go. I mean, this is the way it goes. And so with actors, it, the legs may go, but you're still there, man. You know, you, they, they put you in a chair and they shoot you from the waist up. <laughs> And uh, you're all right. And, and so, you know, it's a different adjustment. And then, of course, um, Simon is primarily a stage actor, he does movies, as that crazy girl keeps telling him to right. kill. You know. <laughs> um, but, but the thing is, with, uh, with, with, um, uh, with, with Simon, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the wear and tear, you know, the, the stamina starts to go. When you're playing the big, anybody here ever see a movie called The Dresser? The oh, Dresser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's great. Uh, Tom Courtney, Albert Finney is amazing. He's amazing, and he plays this actor who literally you could you could feel the exhaustion and his marrow. It's there, and you wonder, you know, about him because it's just so deep and so exhausted from doing it eight times a week. But you're doing sometimes you're doing more. Sometimes you're doing three plays in a, in a day, in the morning. In the old days, the old Edmund Keene days, that's what they did, by the way. Mm -hmm. So he came out of that school, Albert's character in that movie, because he was in the 30s, so they, they came 
fresh out of the early 1900s when they did that. But the point is that you could feel the exhaustion because you can't just walk through these parts. It just can't be done. You can't play King Lear you know, with a breeze. It just doesn't happen. It ain't going to happen. You're not allowed to do it, and nothing can make you do it because <laughs> you're forced to be in it. So what I would say is that that started to happen to Simon, that the exhaustion, and then the mind, the memory. The big thing is the memory. And when we get older, you know, it starts to dwindle or get affected. And that starts to hurt in a way because you're un you lose that thing. You're unsure of not even no, no, remembering the lines from plays that you've done all your life, you know, not, not, never mind new play. So that, that eats at Simon and it, 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 it turns him into, you know, I would think it turned him into uh, turning against acting in, in general and, yeah. and, 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 and losing his appetite. He was really losing his desire and appetite to get up there and forget his words again. <laughs> and we all know it. We've been through it. I've been through it. I've been in Shakespeare roles, believe it or not, when you had to do it eight times a week, right? And you do a, do a performance at, say, 3 o'clock. You know they have those long weekend performances. You have five or six of them. In, you're like, uh, and it's like, I get to do this, and I'm doing this huge speech. I'm up there doing this soliloquy after soliloquy of talking, and, 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 and I'm doing it at 7 o'clock at night. I've, I've just done this speech a couple of hours before, and I'm out there to an audience, and I'm doing the same speech again. So I'm in the middle of it, and I'm so tired and so strange in the world of it that I start thinking, I'm, I'm repeating each line I say. So I'm saying all the lines in this soliloquy twice. <laughs> and I thought, this is happening to me. It's really happening. <laughs> and the audience is there and it's watching me. And it knows I'm losing my mind. But it, does, it doesn't want to bother me. It, it wants me. It's being generous. What a poor guy, you know. Well, you've and I really experienced that. Well, and, and but isn't it true? I, I believe that I've heard. But I didn't say them twice. <laughs> I only thought. You thought you were. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think it was, wasn't it John Barrymore or somebody where the the greatest review he ever got was the night he went out there drunk and didn't even realize what he was doing and came back and that's at that point he said now he knows they thought isn't this such an interesting way uh, such an interesting take on how to how to go yeah, about it and yeah. it, so I mean I guess yeah. it's all in the eye of the beholder. Oh but yeah. Now, what is it, though, I mean, we know for Simon, there's a, a, there was, at least at one time in his life, a great appeal to Shakespeare, Shakespearean parts. Yeah. Um, for you, you've, you've got a, a long and, and rich history with Shakespeare. And oh, yeah. What okay. is it, though, because, you know, you, as an actor, I think you're supposed to um, have it, hold it on such a pedestal, but what is it that actually is the appeal for you personally and, and that, that keeps you going back to it? Uh, in, in mm -hmm. you know, 20th, 21st century. What's the connection for you? Well, because there's, there's, I mean, I'll say the obvious, there's so much in it. Mm -hmm. And that the, I often say to people who talk to me about Shakespeare who've never, who are not actors or directors, who haven't ever played it or done it, the actor learns Shakespeare in another way because he learns it having to do it, having to spend months with it. So. He approaches it in that way and understands it in that way. And the familiarity with the words and the phrases and what the content is, what it's saying, becomes a part of you. And the revelations keep coming long after you've closed in the pen of play. You know, you, you learn things and you hear things in a way that you could never, if you saw the play or if you read the play, no. That's why actors, in a way, are lucky that they get an opportunity to, that's why some of the great ones that did, had the repertoires of plays they did so wanted to do it because it had so much uh, in it. it. It's almost, I can come close to say, say you were a cello, you played the cello or something, and you were playing Bach on the cello. I mean, wow, imagine that, you know. So, so that, that, that manifestation of spirit which comes out of it changes you. It, it lifts your life does. It gives you so much. And once that, that appealed to me when I was very young, actually, really? 
I was a very young guy when I started to do Strindberg and, and, and things like that. I was very affected by that because I thought, here it is with this material. It's like playing the cello because I can kind of just express things in myself. And it made me sort of universal. It gave me a more universal uh, sense of things in myself mm -hmm. because I was doing things that happened years, years ago. I was out of the South Bronx. I was out of the life I come from mm -hmm. into another world that was giving me all this stuff. It was a gift. Mm -hmm. And I knew from that point on, age 21, I knew at that point, I had been acting since I was this big. But at that point, I thought this is what I do with my life. And nothing mattered. Being famous, being rich, nothing. Only doing this. Yeah. Now at 21, that's easy to say. You know, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's just you and pizza, so right. you're fine. <laughs> but it is true, though, right. that did happen to me. Now there was a period that you've talked about at, I, I think it was maybe in the, in the 80s, where you kind of took a little time away from movies, and yeah. then there was a, I guess a conversation, maybe it was with Diane Keaton, I think I remember reading, that spurred you to come back. But what was that period in your life about? Well, I, I needed to I needed to get away. I thought that you know a lot of what I was doing was you know I was like you know I have to say all due respect I was sort of blasted out of a cannon you know I had like five films five Oscar nominations you know I blew out with The Godfather you know that was like uh, you know I didn't know what was happening to me I was just you know drinking and doing and. Having fun and not having fun, <laughs> dying, going crazy. I was doing all those things. But I kept going. You know, something was, I didn't know where I was. And so then I realized that there was this, uh, this trucking thing I had to do. And I, had to, I was told I had to act. I was told I was I'd be doing this. I was getting a lot of these offers and things and pressure, a strange kind of pressure, which I didn't realize. And then I just, Stopped. I stopped because there was something in the business or whatever it was that bothered me. It bothered me that I didn't have a, an identity within this thing we do. I, I was, I was kind of lost. And so I thought it's time maybe to just stop. And I was, I went out and again, even back then, mm -hmm. I took whatever money I had, some of it, and I made these little films, these little things of my own. Who Still have them. them. I did something like The Local Stigmatic mm -hmm. by Hethcote Williams, a thing I love. As a matter of fact, it's a 52-minute film that I recommend. I actually like it. I think it's good. How, I mean, did, how did these get out to the world? How they don't you? go out to the world. Okay. All right, all right. And somebody said, some critic said, yeah. why don't you put this out to the yeah. world? I said, I don't want to. Yeah. And they said, well, why? I said, no, isn't it cool? Mm -hmm. I make a movie and all, and it's really good, and I don't put it out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's like laughs> I, really, I really took a certain right. amount of he didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was being, you know, clever. <laughs> but the point is, I, I did, and then I was doing this kind of thing, and I would do little pieces of theater, little, little things, and I made my own film. I learned about filmmaking, because I was a pretty much of a, I really didn't like it at first. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. I, I came out of the theater, and I was bothered. I was bothered by having to do this. I kept telling my friend Charlie, I said, Charles, it's real and it's not real at the same time. So you're really talking on the phone, but you're not because there's wires all around you and a mic here. But when you're on the stage, everything's made up. I mean, it's all imaginary. So you're in the same world, and I was used to that. So I was confused by it. But anyway, I, I, I did do it, and uh, I, I, I finally worked my way back. Um, I, 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 I really started to understand, finally, what, what saves most actors in movies who have to do a lot of them, and that's the camper. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what was it? Was there a conversation? Was there something that brought you back? What, it yeah, was, you yeah. know what? I was living with Diane Keaton at the time. So it was a long time ago, and she was great. I loved her so. And we had a great relationship, mm -hmm. and, and she worked, and, and she was out there, and I would do whatever I wanted. I walked to the park. I went. My, you know, I, my life just changed. I got off that pressure cooker. I didn't have to perform. I didn't have to make be in something that was on a certain level. I just could breathe. And I made my own little picture without 
since it was my own money, didn't matter if it went out or didn't go out. So I was freed. I had no pressure. And just experiencing that. And then I had no money. <laughs> <laughs> and Diane was looking at me, you know. <laughs> and she said, uh, you know, remember at the time, she says, what do you think? What do you think? You know how Diane is. <laughs> what do you think? I said, Ab about what? And she said, about you're broke. <laughs> I said, yeah. She says, well, what do you think you're going to do? Go back to living in the little room? <laughs> That's over, buddy. She says, you've been rich too long. I said, no, I can do it. <laughs> I saw the wheels turning. <laughs> she says, this guy's going to climb on my back here. <laughs> and I thought, well, no. You know, she understood it. She was great. And she was very encouraging. I, I just love Diane. She's the most wonderful person. One time I lost a lot of money in a tax thing. I didn't know what I was doing with money. But I'm sure a lot of you are like this. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, watch your money. Uh, because people get a little like, you know. But you've got to be careful with that. Because I know it recently happened to me. But the point is, at the time, she came into my lawyer's office and 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 she looked at me and my lawyer and I was standing there and she looked <laughs> at the lawyer and she said to him what do you do do you know who he is about the money the lawyer said uh, she said do you know who he is and the lawyer said yeah, yeah. <laughs> she says no you don't <laughs> he says I don't she says no He's an idiot. <laughs> He's an idiot. And you've got to take care of him. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then she <laughs> says to me, this is the truth. She says, Al, come here. I got something you're going to like. I said, yeah. She says, it's you. It's for you. You got to get back, buddy. You think you're, you're an A guy. You're not, a, you're not on the A list. You're not on the A-list, buddy. I said, okay. She said, here it is, Sea of Love. She gave me Sea of Love. And I did, you know, Sea of Love. She, somebody else was into it. I won't mention that man. <laughs> but somebody else wanted to do it. And I took Sea of Love. I said, well, she says, this is a good picture for you. I knew I had to work, you know. I did, I needed the money too. I don't know what I was going to do otherwise, but I did feel, let's face it, at the time, I was not that old, and I thought, you know, and I knew I had, I had some, you know, I had some clout. I, I thought, I'm walking through Central Park once, and this guy's walking the other way, coming toward me. And I looked at the guy, I looked at, he looked at me, he says, this wasn't happening to me much. I got to tell you, the truth is, you, start, you stay away, pe people forget you, which is cool. It was very cool for me. <laughs> I felt good. I was out there walking. You know, right. Somebody was come over to me and say, What's your, are you Al Pacino? I say, yeah. Says, Congratulations. You look like your otter. <laughs> so, but, you know, that wasn't happening as much right. anymore. And I was, like, <laughs> I was getting used to being in a certain way. There was a kind of thing that happened. It, it didn't just happen. And I'm so grateful for those four years. But this guy's coming down this path, and he looks at me and he says, hey man, what are you doing? I said, oh, what do you mean? He says, you don't do movies? I don't see you in the movies anymore. <laughs> what happened to you? I said, well, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I said, he said, hey, <laughs> go to the movies. Come on, man, we miss you. <laughs> beautiful, man. Huh? It was beautiful. It made me think a little bit. So I, I, I wanted to say, well, you don't know the whole story. You know, was, when I was a boy, my life. <laughs> but as it is now, you know, I went back and I got lucky. I gave it to Marty Bregman. Marty Bregman is a great producer. Produced Scarface, uh, Dog Day, um, Serpico, Carlito's Way, and Sea of Love. I mean, just those movies I made. Yeah. He, he, was, he was my guy. I think I'm, I'm missing a lot not having him around anymore. I must say, you know, because he was what is so rare in what we do is a facilitator. Mm -hmm. You need a facilitator because you're, you know, it's it's very important to you to get these things on, and a person can do that. And some people are very, 
nice facilitators, some are not, but you need them. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to come back to the humbling for a second, I know that a lot of people have been bringing up to you and asking you, you know, sort of raising parallels between the humbling and Birdman. Yeah. I want to instead ask you about another movie that I, I thought might, I don't know if it inspired you in any way. Obviously, the book was its own thing, the script was its own thing, but do you remember Ronald Coleman in A Double Life? A Double Life, yeah. yeah. Where he plays Othello. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems to me. I don't remember it completely, but I saw it a couple of times. Yeah. yeah and I, I just thought, uh, I wonder, I was curious if that or any other, you know, earlier work, whether it's a book or a movie. Well, I, I can't help but think that Birdman and uh, this are just so different. I, yeah. I don't say they're actors, but they're not as the same. <laughs> First of all, Birdman is a satire in yeah, a way. Right. It's a farce. And this is kind of a, I think it's a kind of a tragic comedy or something. But mm -hmm. they're so different. Tempo and all that. I mean, it's a different environment. It's a different force. I mean, Birdman is this force of Wow, you know, it comes at you yeah. like that. I mean, it's like a <laughs> staggering, startling right. piece of work. It's it's brilliant, and but it but it's so. But this is the opposite yeah, yeah. of that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, but it, but um, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. We'll see. That the idea that the actors are now being made, m movies are being made about actors. I think Julie, um, Julie, what's her name? Julianne Moore. Yeah, yeah. She's in a, she's a, uh, you know. In oh, a Maps to the Stars. That was Maps the other, yeah, that's another one where she's. So it's, it's interesting how these things always come in and. Like waves. Burden me. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so just to do the. Oh, the humbling more? You want more? No, humbling? no, that's fine. No, that's, we don't know. You, but, well, uh, humbling is, is <coughs> got, is, is this, uh, is this thing because I, like I was saying before, it, it, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing with when a back life like uh, the guy from Humbling, when he's what it comes out of, and the need he has, and he like he says acting since he was nine, that's what he knows of the world. He never know he didn't understand why people like Thanksgiving, uh, you know what what is a hearth, and he wants to get back to something that he's played all these things, you know, and wants to experience it because acting to him was like this. Uh, Water in a desert. Yeah. And I love that expression because that's what it is to all of us. It's like it comes in, and if it isn't, well, what are you doing it for? Right, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, t but to that point, though, is it still as appealing to you when the studios that once made the movies that, you know, the ones that we, the, all, many of the greats that you were a part of were studio made movies, yeah. the Godfather movies, Serpico, hey, Panic, Dog Day. Panic in P Needle Park. Was From the beginning, yeah, right movie. off the bat. Yeah. And now, does it, when you look at, when you look at the state of things and essentially almost everything that comes out of studios is either a remake or sequel or an adaptation, now it's board games, next it'll be street signs, like who knows? Well, I better uh, get, Like yeah. what, what is the, it seems like the only place for a person who really wants to act is either independent movies or television. No, get into one of those big films. Yeah, right, well, you could, <laughs> you know, you're going to play a stop there. sign. I'm, I'm like ready with a Marvel <laughs> comics. I, <mean>. right. <laughs> I actually said, right. my, 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 my kids took me, my little kids took yeah. me to uh, see uh, Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy. Gar right. Guardians yeah, yeah. of the Galaxy. And I was awed by it. I thought, what is this <laughs> in the sound <laughs> and the invention right. in the movie? And I mean, it, I, it made, you know, it, it made Birdman look a little pale, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was really... The big stuff, and I thought it was witty, and it was funny, and it was dark, and it was. I said, "Gee, it went, it went on a little long, but at times, right. <laughs> but it was all right." At sections, right. we all had that. But the point is, it was very, very impressive. So, in passing, in in uh, I was in Venice, and I was being interviewed, and I said, "Gee, I don't know what did you like lately." And I said, "Well, I saw this movie, Galaxy of the Gate, or whatever," <laughs> and, uh, and I said. I was very impressed with that. I really yeah. was. The, I was impressed with the ingenuity. Mm -hmm. I was the invention of it. Yeah. You know, come on, can't be a snob, really. Although I try. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, it was good well, in do. a lot of ways. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, it was all over, <laughs> all over the place. That I liked Galaxy. Guardians. It right. was all over the internet. And right. they, and I met with the guy actually. Marvel, yeah. Marvel. Guy, Kevin nice Feige. Guy, or, right? Yeah, yeah. And well. It was, so, well, do do one of those. You can make as many home movies as you as you yeah. want for the rest of it. <laughs> Been there, done that. Right. Well, 
the, just to, to wind things down here, oh. we have a few. I mean, it's been great, and I so appreciate kidding? it. This but is a stage. <laughs> <laughs> These are sort of a uh, plank and a passion from the from the audience. We have basically oh. questions that are uh, first thing that comes Forgot to your all mind. About you. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so from Tony Sago, 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 Mr. Pacino, can you recall the exact moment that inspired you to become an actor? It sounds like we may have talked about that. Well, I sort of mentioned that when I said I was yeah. doing that thing, and it came to me that yeah. something something profound was going through me that I had a, an, I, I had a way in to myself, yeah. a way into my life, and sort of expressing myself through this, you know, th th this, th th this great writing and literature, and it just consumed me, and uh, I, I was taken, that was it, but what inspired me to act was when I was little, I guess, uh, I have to tell you this, my, 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 my eighth grade teacher had me read the Bible, so I'd read the song for the auditorium. Assembly, remember Assembly? Do you guys know? <laughs> Some of you old enough to remember <laughs> Well, I'd be the guy who came out and read you the Psalms. <laughs> Only I didn't read them. I just read them. <laughs> you know, and the teacher just kind of liked me for some reason. Right. Nobody else did, but she liked me. <laughs> and, and she went up to the South Bronx, my tenement, fifth floor with my grandmother and my grandmother and grandfather and mother, we all lived together in this little tenement up there. She walked up all the way up, six flights, went into my apartment and was having coffee with all people, my grandmother. And she was telling her that she should keep, I should do this with my life. So I think that was a, a turning point, not for me, for my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> because she said, there's no way yeah. he's going to be an actor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, we have from uh, Scooter Downey, what's the best direction you've ever received on a, on a set? The best direction, well, one of the best things that I, comes to my mind now is this AD, a guy named Bert Harris, on Dog Day Afternoon. Well. He came up to me, I was in the, uh, first of all, he'd get me sober every morning. <laughs> <laughs> he'd hit me with those tomato juices and stuff. And, uh, I'd come in. Some girl the other night was describing knowing me in Godfather 2, how I'd come in with a crazy hat and scarves and, <laughs> and stuff, and then I would have to turn into Michael. Yeah, you know, right, right. Slowly, right. it would just go, yeah. <laughs> and I'd become this. But anyway, uh, Bert Harris came up to me. Smart kid. I mean, smart man, and I was in the middle of stuff, and he just came over and whispered in my ear, because we were in Dog Day, we were out there with all the, uh, I recommend the movie on a big screen, if you could ever see it, mm -hmm. to see what Lamette does with a crowd and with the street, and to put you in it in such a way, it, it just is kinetic. You could feel the energy yeah. in it. It was, it was a turning point uh, in films, and in, in the way he did it. But anyway, this guy, Bert, Bert Harris, came, comes up to me, this is what I love about movies, too. And he look, leans in and he says, uh, say, say Attica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, what? He said, go with the crowd, on. just yell out, Attica. <laughs> okay, remember Attica. <laughs> because Attica was a prison that had had a lot of trouble and terrible prisoners were killed. It was a real scandal. It was so... In, in the world, you know, it was right there. And, and uh, uh, I, I said, oh, okay, so go ahead, you see, just go out there. So I went out, and there I am, and there's all these extras out there, staying on there all day long in there, and they start talking, they're looking at the cops, and, all, and I just say, yeah, what about Attica? At one point, I just had to the cop, I says, Attica. And I looked to the crowd, and I said, hey, Remember Attica, huh? Attica, and they went, yeah, Attica. So he's Attica, and all of a sudden this thing, Attica, Attica. This became a fucking uh, iconic moment. Absolutely. In the movies, yeah. and that's how it came about. <laughs> that's amazing. Isn't I never, that something? Yeah. I, I mean, this is the way these things happen in films. If you're open to it, yeah. and that's the kind of brain that uh, Lamette had, that Bert had, and we would do things like that. 
and you know, it, it just, oh, it just became this magic. It's yeah. magical. That's amazing. When you're out there, you got the room. But when you're doing a movie in six weeks, they don't have time for that again. Yeah, right, right. That's, well, <laughs> but that's sad, because look at what we're losing. That, you, that wouldn't have happened. But that wouldn't have happened, no, no. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Eric Deskin, Mr. Al P. Is there a director or actor that you haven't had the chance to work with? Who is the director or actor that you haven't had the chance to work with who you'd most like to? Well, Martin Scorsese, I never worked you with never? him. You never? Wow. No. That would be it? No. That would be amazing. I'm supposed to work with him in a year with Joe Pesci and De Niro and Bobby Cannavale. Wow. And <laughs> yeah. But that's a ways away. I'm going to do a David Mamet play next, next year. Okay. New play, new play. New play, which is very interesting, to work with him, to be uh, you know no, to sort awesome of uh, collaborate with him is very interesting. Well, very interesting. It's worked out nicely in the past. Who else would I want to work with? Um, I I just I'm I must say that isn't like doesn't ever dawn on me. Yeah. Never did. Yeah. E except. I think of things, the movies and plays, I think in terms of what the story is of the play, yeah. what, what the story of the movie is, what, where's the part? The, to me, the play is the thing. Mm -hmm. The play is the thing. So that sort of comes first. Right. That makes sense. Well, it ha just out of curiosity, sort of a follow-up to that, is there, what's the last movie or performance that just blew you away? That I've seen on yeah. the film? Oh, there's so many. There's just so many. I, I, I have to say, you know, I, 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 I have really have to think. Uh, I see so many really good movie, good uh, performances, and because uh, the thing that, and the truth is, actors are good. I mean, they're really good, uh, and uh, they get better and better, and especially in film because, you know, I mean, they they acquire this relationship with the camera and the way they act and. Also, method acting is very good yeah. for film because it's, uh, it makes you, it's all about how, you know, thinking and stuff and, mm. and bringing things to a, a reality. But <coughs> I, I, I am impressed with what everybody's impressed with, yeah. the actors, everybody is to yeah. single one out I, I, I right at this moment. Sure, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> an unfair. Yeah. Um, unfair. I think we have, we have time for just two more. Sure, here, I'm ready. So <laughs> 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 uh, okay, well, let's, this one we've covered. Um, from E.M. Al, of all the Godfather actors, which t who taught you the most? Oh. <laughs> I could say Lee Strasberg, mm -hmm. yeah, right, but right. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but Lee did teach me something in a movie I did with him called Injustice for All. That was another yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And I would come, I was, came to late, I, I came late, I, I had a little trouble for a while with Norman Jewison. We, we, we had disagreed about a couple of things. As a matter of fact, I disagreed much more with directors when I was younger. And it just, I just decided one day, oh, come on, don't even bother. <laughs> you know, just put, put your case forward, mm -hmm. and if they don't agree, they don't agree. You've got to figure it out. There's a very funny thing going on. It's a story that you might like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really an interesting story. I don't know if I should say it. <laughs> <laughs> We've come this far. Godfather <laughs> 2. Godfather 2. I'm in a scene. It's a long story, but I'll make it short. I won't give you the other part of it, because the <laughs> other part is wicked. I don't want to go there. No, sorry. I'm, I, you know why I'm thinking of it? Because it represents what I was just trying to say to you. Yeah. I'm doing The Godfather 2. And we're in the boathouse, me and Duval, and, and we're doing the scene where I hand over the Don ship or the, you know, the leadership to Bob Duval. And Bob is sitting there and I'm with him. And for some reason, we did the scene and it's over. And for some crazy reason, Diane and I, the next day, go to watch Rushes in this sort of uh, community room, which had pool tables in the back and kitchen on the side. It was, and we go there, and we're going to watch the dailies, the Rushes, the film that we did the other night, the other day. So the film comes on, 
Bob Duval is there. I'm there with Diane, Francis Coppola, and Gordy Willis, the mm -hmm. cinematographer. The great Gordy Willis mm -hmm. and the great Francis Ford Coppola. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. Wow. <laughs> and we're all there, and we're looking at the rushes. And I start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I start giggling a little because what I'm really seeing is darkness. Darkness, darkness. And I'm thinking, and I lean in to Diane and I say, I should loop a line in the scene which says, I deliberately kept the lights low, Bob, <laughs> because I don't want anybody to see us talking. Read our lips or mm -hmm. something. Because I didn't see anything or anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm watching this thinking, well, something is wrong with the projector. She's right. laughing right. on the floor now. Because <laughs> I keep coming up with line <laughs> after line of what we're watching. Finally, it's over. You know, I have a relationship with Francis, you got to understand. We, we were both young, I had two pictures with him. Right. So I turned to him and I said, Francis, well, looks like we're going to have to do it over. <laughs> he said, no, nah, we're not doing it over. What do you mean, do it over? Because after it ended, Bob Duval got up, went into the kitchen there, that concession, and I heard him going, <laughs> You know how he does it sometimes? <laughs> and I heard him there. I thought, what the fuck? <laughs> and I realized, something's up. <laughs> so I, I, later I found out that he was upset with his makeup, which is really ironic, no? <laughs> <laughs> they call it something like displacement or something <laughs> is the psychological term or uh, <laughs> disassociation, <laughs> whatever. Now, I'm sitting there and I turn to Francis and said, this ain't gonna work. Uh, Francis said, can't see anybody. <laughs> and nobody's talking about it either, you know. <laughs> We're just sitting there in the dark. He says, it's not, it's gonna work. I said, no, it isn't. The studio's good. He says, it's going to work. I said, OK. <laughs> OK, now I'm really upset. I was really upset. That was not going to work. And of course, Gordon Willis is sitting there with him. I have to say this. This is not a boast. Mm -hmm. But sure enough, of course, the studio says, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> now we got to shoot the scene again. So we're in the, this is good for, you all know what I'm talking about. We're in the boathouse and I'm sitting down like this. And all of a sudden, Francis says, oh, he says, Al, could you, uh, we're doing the scene. He says, could you, could you lift your head up a little? The, the light isn't getting it, you know. <laughs> I said, Francis, light, the light's not getting me? He says, no. I said, oh, you mean so when I'm down here talking, it's not seeing me? He said, no. I said, I got an idea. Let's put a light down here. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was me. I stopped doing that. That's I really way. did. And it was. I stopped doing that. My performances went right down the drain. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but the truth is, you know. I got tired, but Francis is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, you know. But at the same time, I remembered that that was something I would normally do. I would do that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, I had to find another way. Now, at the same scene, I find a way to do that same scene and get my head up in the light. Mm -hmm. You know, because, come on, you know, you learn enough. You learn more, too. I was inexperienced then. Mm -hmm. I didn't have but a few movies in me. But after a while, you learn that that's part of their work, that's part of the job, and you go with it. But at the time, that's, that's the kind of guy I was. That was very interesting. Oh, yeah. The, the You'd have loved me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the last thing is this, and this is from Celeste Thorson. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. But uh, which character 
emotionally changed you the most as, as, from, from your experience of inhabiting it? The Godfather did. The Godfather changed me in a, in a, in a way for a while. Mm -hmm. And I went back because it was so intense. It was so, uh, um, I, I had to go to places in myself at that time in my life. I've learned since not to do that, frankly, how to do it without having to do that, mm -hmm. without having to pay a price uh, taken, out of, taken out of your own hide, so to speak, and find a way that you can do that and yet breathe at the same time. I, I found that I stayed in that guy and, and then I went on being in him for a while. And that, that, that was upsetting to my life. So, uh, you know, that's true. That was the only thing. I remember with Dog Day, too. I did Dog Day Afternoon. And, and, and uh, um, I mean, you know how it is. I'm playing Serpico. And I'm in the car. And I'm going in the car in the back of a cab. I'm in the back of a taxi. And, I'm in the, and I see this truck in front of me. And the truck is shooting out this black stuff, you know, this black smoke. Like they do, they gas it out. And it's like, comes, they used to do that, the carbon, mm -hmm. whatever they call it. And it's all over the place. I just loathe that. It bothers me. As a New Yorker, it bothers me. <laughs> that we got to walk around in that crap, you know. So I'm, I said to this guy, so I just said to the cab driver, pull up in front of that, front of that truck, pull up. Get up in front of that truck, please. We just get up in front of the, the cab of that truck. So, so he goes in there. I wonder what the hell is going on. <laughs> he goes right in the front of it. I pull out my gold shield badge, my, my detective badge. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, you, fucker. <laughs> pull over. <laughs> From the back of the cab. And I got... I got this badge in my hand. <laughs> I'm impersonating an officer. <laughs> but this is the part. You know, you're in the part right. somehow. <laughs> you're going along to work and you're just doing a thing. And all of a sudden you do something like that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just funny, isn't it? It's funny. Well, it's... Uh I don't think we can thank you enough for being so open. Oh, and my honest. pleasure, man. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.